Yeah, so today I'm going to talk to you about the epidemic of fatherlessness and to just give you the reason why I'm actually giving this talk. So during the summer, I went to South Africa for 10 weeks and I did a placement. And one of the components of this placement is something called Action at Home. And that's essentially where you relay what you've learned while on placement back at home. And initially, I'd wanted to go to a global development conference but someone more senior in the company took my spot, so I couldn't go. <laughs> but nevertheless, the opportunity came for me to give a talk, and I decided that it's something that was on my heart, something that really affected me while I was there, so I thought that I'd give it a go. And um, so, yes, let's get cracking, guys. Um, usually when people go to places like Cape Town, they'll talk to you about the natural beauty, they'll talk to you about going to a waterfall while going from Kirsten Bosch Gardens to the top of Table Mountain or the views while on the middle of Table Mountain or even the view at the top of Table Mountain. Or they'll talk about the cultural sites and a place called Mzoli's was basically the truest rags to riches story that I've ever heard where a guy who started making a barbecue out of a shack developed his business to the point at which he was making out of two shacks to the point at which he made a whole shop. And now he's got a 50-50 partnership business with this guy from America who handles all of the management side of it while Lemzoli does all the branding and he handles all the food, basically. And people from all around the world come to this poor township on Sundays and m most days of the week, but Sundays is quite popular. And it just brings a whole new, new dynamic to the community and it's brought life to so many people who, in other situations, would have been on drugs or in gangs. And um, there's a place called Bokarp, which is a place um, which was mainly filled with Muslims in the middle of Cape Town. And during apartheid, they were forced to wear dull colours. And the minute apartheid was lifted, they thought, in, in basically in rebellion to what we've been constrained to, let's paint our houses different colours. And um, this is just a symbol of the freedom that people have found since the lifting of apartheid. And you get Robben Island, which is where Nelson Mandela spent nearly, well, over 20 years of his life for fighting for freedom. And it's become such a key cultural spot in Cape Town. And it's a reminder to people of the restraints that once were before apartheid was lifted. And so, one question I would like to ask you is, where are all of these things now? All of these things from Bokarp to Table Mountain, they're all still in Cape Town. I can't lift Table Mountain and show it to you here in this lecture theatre. I can't get Mzoli's and bring you his food here. Like, those things stay in South Africa. But what I wanted to share with you guys was what came back with me. And that's a stark reality that fatherlessness is a big issue that needs to be tackled in the world. And I understand that this term epidemic is big and most people would say that this problem doesn't warrant a term as big as epidemic. But as opposed to showing you different statistics that will prove to you that fatherlessness affects how well you're going to do in school or whether you're going to get involved in gangs, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on the journey that I went on and I'm going to show you different stories, different people's lives that have been affected by this and I'm going to bring you to the point of realisation that I came to. And so we're going to start at a place called Oasis. Oasis is a place where I was placed. And um, they are a non-profit organisation that mainly deals with street youth. And youth in South Africa is anybody from the age of 18 to 35. And they would go into different townships set up football tournaments, get to know people, and bring them into Oasis with the hope of actually developing them as individuals to be placed back in the communities and become community leaders. And as I already said, my relation to it was that I was working there and um, I got to experience all of the different parts of Oasis and all, the diff all of the different pieces of this organisation. And regarding its relationship to fatherlessness oasis has as a key part of it a rehabilitation center for drug addicts and um 
the first phase is where they pick you up and they take you off the streets and they try and make you basically clean from drugs. And this takes, for some people, a month, some people six months. But Oasis is very strict in that it gives people two months to really prove that they can be strong enough to come off the streets and come off drugs. And it's a tough process. And I've spoken to many people who said that it was one of the hardest things that they've experienced. And the second phase of rehabilitation is when they come to live in the place that I was working in. So I had a lot of contact with these people who were sometimes just three months clean off drugs. And the reason that I've said so much promise is because I would get into conversations with certain people. There was this one guy called Matisse, and he used to be a millionaire. He used to own countless businesses, and he had a beautiful house. He had many homes, in fact. He owned a boat. He was married. He, he had what we would call a good life. And sadly, his best friend ran away with his wife on his boat, and they took all his money. His wife had one of his businesses. And due to that experience, he turned to drugs, and he lost all of his money and ended up on the streets. And Oasis picked him up. And even though he has come to the point of cleanness and he's off drugs, I would still say that he's hit a brick wall. So there's so much promise in his life, but he hasn't progressed to that stage at which I could satisfactorily say that he's made it and that he has completely turned his life around. And the reason that I've said that Oasis has presented to me a fatherless cycle is because the vast majority of the men in these phases of rehabilitation are fathers. They have children on the outside who are grown up without fathers. The vast majority of these men who are in Oasis grew up without fathers. So if you join up the dots, you can see that it's fatherless children who have given birth to fatherless children. And at this point, I wasn't sort of putting these things together and thinking about fatherlessness as a problem. I was just experiencing these things, so I would like you guys to do the same thing. And um, there was this one guy called Eugene Ashley, and he was one of the South African volunteers that worked with us. And he was also somebody in the second phase of rehabilitation. And in my opinion, he was a break from the norm. His role as a father was something that motivated him to come into work on days when I would be downhearted, days when I couldn't be bothered to do my work. He would come into the office, be sort of vibrant, be happy, be bubbly, and he would be lifting up the whole mood in the office. And for somebody who's been clean off drugs for about three months, he hasn't seen his daughters in weeks, for him to come and give life to us, that's, that's something that really stuck with me. And... Um, I was talking to him once and I was writing down his story and everything that he'd been through and he said that when he was on drugs he would go and visit his daughters and he'll knock on the door they'll come to the door and the minute they see him they'll close the door in his face and he said that those things completely tore him to pieces and um, when he started to turn his life around when he began to find again who he was and to come off drugs he went back to his house he knocked on the door and his daughter ran up to him and she said, that's my daddy. She's like, that's my daddy. And she ran into his arms. And the joy that I saw in his face when he was relaying that story to me again stuck with me and showed me how important this role of being a father was to him. And his relationship with his father was key to his life because while he was on drugs, his father was the one who was looking after his daughters and who, to some extent, was looking after him in making sure that when he needed to get a fix, when he needed to get his drugs, he was getting it from safe places. So when his father died, that had a massive effect on his mind state and how he viewed himself and on the well-being of his daughters. And so Eugene, we can clearly see, is a person who um, is a break from the norm. He's not like the rest of the people in that phase of rehabilitation. He was somebody who really stood out to me. Next, I want to talk to you about a guy called Tom Smith. His name's actually Tom Smith. That's like a, uh, yeah, a sort of just like a cover because I'm going to speak quite in depth about his life. So um, I had to like protect his identity and all that stuff. And um, to me, like, he was a real light in the darkness. And um, 
he, in fact, is somebody whose father was present in his life. And um, he was also one of the people in that phase of rehabilitation. And to just give you a sort of a, a, an, an overview as to how he got to Oasis, he was the son of a pastor. And um, in his family, he was the fourth generation to become the leader of this church that his dad was the leader of. And he didn't want to do that job. That path was set out for him. That path was expected of him. And he decided that it wasn't for him. So he rebelled against his family. It became a thing of where it was him against the rest of his family, him against his father. His family said to him, it's my way or it's the highway. And he picked the highway, basically. And um, that had a bad effect on him, of course. But on the surface, it looks like he was successful. He acquired a BSc in analytical chemistry. He became a graphic designer. But in his heart, he always had the feeling of the need to please his father. And as he rejected his father, his father continually grew callous towards him. And the more callous towards, his, towards him his father became, the more that he would do to try and gain the attention of his father. And so he would start off by drinking. His father would first react to it, then become calloused, then he would go to drugs. His father would first react, then become calloused, so he would go to even stronger drugs. And it was just a cycle of him getting further and further into a slump and losing himself in the things that he was trying to find his life in. But nevertheless, he went to rehab, but that failed. He went to another rehab, and that failed. And he went to rehab about four times and always found himself back out on the street. So Oasis was like his, his, the fifth place that he had come to to try and get clean. And as I was speaking to him, me and him would have these conversations about philosophy, about the world, and about all these interesting things. And I'm thinking, wow, like, I can't actually imagine you wasting your life. He'll talk to me about graphic design. He'll talk to me about all the things that he wants to see change in the world. And it would just inspire me on a day-to-day -day basis. So for me, he was a proper light in the darkness. And um, one thing that I want to share with you is a journal entry that he wrote. And so I was leaving work one day, and he just stopped me. He's like, oh, Kwame, Kwame, come back. And he, he handed me these two pieces of paper. And what it is is a journal entry that he had written, um, marking key periods in his life. And so this was written on the 13th of August this year, but it, um, it records a time about a few years before when he was on drugs, so I will read it. Drugs have taken over my life. Here I was, a drug-eating, meth-smoking drug addict with an IQ of 156 and a BSc in analytical chemistry with all the talent in the world. Bound down, pinned down, and isolated because of my pursuit of happiness. The pastor's son will amount to nothing. He is a poor excuse for a son, are some of the things people said. My tears felt like acidic rain. Ac ac acidic rain. Nobody seemed to get that I didn't wake up one morning with a craving for tick. To a certain degree, I thought that one cared. There was the gaping cavity in my soul and drugs and alcohol temporarily filled it. One day, soaking wet and out in the cold, I stood high but crying. People looked at me while passing by with much concern, but nobody stopped to ask what was wrong. I needed somebody, anybody to stop and just say, everything is going to be all right. Suicidal thoughts took over and I needed somebody to save me. Suddenly, a calmness came over me and God spoke to me and said, son, everything is going to be all right. On the brink of suicide, I was saved. And you can imagine, like, the first time I was reading this, like, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, Alex, like, I just want to help you. But he was the type of person who I knew was destined for good things. And, in fact, out of all the people in this phase of rehabilitation, during my time in Oasis... He was the only one to actually move out and go on to something better. And so about two weeks before I left, he moved to a different organisation where he 
was giving life skills lessons to rehabilitated drug addicts. And for me, that makes him a real light in the darkness. And next, I'd like to introduce you to this place called Parkwood. And Parkwood is a community in the Cape Flats. And when I tell you that, honestly, I smell more marijuana smoke than oxygen in this place. Like, I'm not exaggerating. Like, drugs and gang violence have completely destroyed this place. And you can see it in everything from the infrastructure to the people's clothes to the way that they talk and the way they interact. It has completely taken over. And um, my relation to it is that uh, it is one of the communities in which Oasis has something called a 2020 soccer tournament. And um, they would go in, set up a football tournament and um, use that to reach out to the, the children in the community, the youth. And I was heavily involved with that tournament and I went into Parkwood at least once a week for the nine weeks that I was working with Oasis. And so I got like a really good understanding of how it works. And um, why have I called Parkwood the result of fatherlessness? So there was this one time when we went into Parkwood with a van and picked up about 12 of the kids, like from ranging from the age of about 12 to 20. We just brought them into Oasis, said, yeah, we're gonna give you some life skills lessons and we're gonna give you a meal, just come in and yeah, let's, let's interact. And um, so we brought them into Oasis, did some life skills lessons with them. And we just sat in a circle and just got to talking. And it was in this time that we really got an understanding of how their minds worked and what they wanted from life. And they would tell us things like, oh yeah, like we, um, we go and rob people's houses because we believe that they robbed our ancestors. And if we steal from them, they are going to be able to replace it. So, yeah, they, they felt no remorse for the deeds that they did. They told us about how they were shooting people, etc. And um, obviously we were taken aback and shocked. And um, how this relates to fatherlessness is that these guys were 15, 16, 17 years old. And some of them had two kids. And when I was in Parkwood, I would see seven or eight-year-olds just running around... <coughs> while we were playing football and just like around all of the drugs, around all of the violence, around all of the gangs. And if you consider that these 15 and 16 year olds have got two children, they're not gonna be able to parent them properly. These seven and eight year olds are gonna be growing up in parentless environments and the likelihood is that they're gonna be having unprotected sex because that's the reality in the community of Parkwood. And then what follows on from that is them having children at the age of 15 and 16, and these children then being put in the same environment. And so what we see is a horrible cycle that just continues to go in this community. But I'd like to introduce you to a guy called Zeldin, who I would call a small sign of hope. So Zeldin's father was a drug lord in Parkwood. He... Um, was one of the main people that people would go to essentially to supply them for their drugs. He orchestrated a lot of the things that were happening within Parkwood. And um, Zeldin was heavily involved in that when he was younger. And um, thankfully, he managed to see that that life wasn't for him. And at the time that I had spoken to him, he was about two months clean of drugs. And of course, like, that's, that, that was a big thing for him. And growing up in a community where drugs are so readily available and so cheap like it was about 50p like for for like for like a, a little bag of weed like that's it's, it's crazy and they're cheaper than cigarettes drugs like tick and drugs like meth and drugs like heroin they, they're so cheap like they, they're just they're pounds and they're, they're just readily available to them and for him to be clean off drugs living in that community for two months was a big accomplishment and um his mother was heavily involved in the community. She ran um, co like community, place, community projects for women in the community to teach them how to be better mothers, to teach them how to pour into their community. So to see him and his mother making a positive impact in the community despite what he had been through and despite who his father was, was again to me a real motivation. And the last time I spoke to him before I came back to England, he um, was 
on the verge of opening up a new organisation to help the youth in his community alongside the work that he was doing through his church to reach out to the boys in his community. <coughs> so despite the context that he grew up in, to me, Zeldin was a small sign of hope. And um, still bearing in mind that up until these points, I wasn't drawing the dots between all of these problems and fatherlessness. I was just experiencing these problems, having conversations with people, talking to people, seeing what their views were. But it was this one car journey I had with a guy called Keith, who was the chairman of an organisation called MITS, which is making an impact through sports. And they were quite similar to Oasis, but they um, were mainly focused in an area called Mitchell's Plain, which is absolutely notorious for drugs and gang violence. And um, we were driving through this one place called Tafelsich and another place called Lentekir, and these places have, like, crazy murder rates and, like, school children being shot in crossfires on a weekly basis. And he was just showing us all of the, all of the political stimuli for these problems, all of the social stimuli for these problems. And... Um, he just said this quote, he was like, we were just talking and he came out of it, he was like, this is the fatherless generation. And that absolutely struck my core. And this happened less than a week before I came back to England. And it was literally like that penny drop moment. It just added up all the dots. It was like a mass puzzle that I was able to solve. And it really just put everything together. When he said, this is the fatherless generation, it really, really struck home with me. And um, I haven't actually thanked him for that, but that's, that's something that I definitely have to do because it, it really did bring light to the whole situation. And so I've called this an epidemic. And again, to reiterate, I understand that this is a big term. And how can I actually prove that this is a global e epidemic? Because I've given you examples from Cape Town. And it'll be fair to say that these are somewhat extreme cases. But um, if we look at Chicago, which is a city in Illinois, I want to ask you guys, is this an American Parkwood? So you look at the black, the black, uh, the black community in Chicago, and 73% of children grow up in single-parent homes. And again, I apologise for statistics, but I feel like in this instance, it really is necessary so 73% of children grow up in single-parent homes in the black community. Nearly 42% of children in the black community grow up under the line of poverty. This year, there's been 322 murders in this one city. And since August the 9th, over 100 have been murdered. And that, if you've been following the Mike Brown case in Ferguson, you'll know that that has gained a lot of media um, media attention, but these over 100 murders in Chicago haven't gained one. And that is just testament to how commonplace it is for there to be black on black and gang violence in Chicago. But nevertheless, is there a reason for optimism? We've seen through Eugene that there's a break in the norm. We've seen through Tony that there can be lights in the darkness. We can see, we've seen through Zeldin that there is a small sign of hope. And um, people may disagree even at this point, but I do feel that fatherlessness is a key issue. What I'm not saying is that a child who's grown up in a fatherless home is doomed to fail. Like, I, I think that's just completely incorrect. And the majority of the presentation has been focused on the anomalies such as Tony, such as Eugene, such as Zeldin. What I do want to ask is, is this good enough? Is it enough for us to have one lamp in a whole room of darkness? Or do we want to make the whole room light up? And personally for me, I don't feel like it's enough to have anomalies. I feel like there is a need to change the norm as opposed to just breaking it. And I want you guys to consider this. If there is a father 
who was perfect and who could fulfill the needs that fathers are lacking in, how would you receive him or accept him? And us who have grown up with fathers, even though that our fathers are not perfect, but if there was one that was perfect, how would you respond? And when Jesus was talking to people in first century Jerusalem, he introduced God to them as a father. And in the famous Lord's Prayer, the first line is our father. And I don't think we in this community understand how radical that was. To call God father, to have an intimate relationship with him, was something completely unheard of. And he came and saw that that was the most important thing that he needed to deliver to people, that God was a father. And if he came to offer this relationship to all people, then I would say that this epidemic may have met its match. Thank you guys for listening, and let it mull over in your minds a bit. And if you've got any questions, then just throw them out at me. Thank you.